Welcome to IBBME's Focal Point, where each episode we highlight research at the Institute of Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering here at the University of Toronto. So my name is Miloš Popovic. I'm a professor at the Institute of Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering. I'm also Toronto Rehab Chair in Spinal Cord Injury Research, and my laboratory is located at the Linnicher Centre at Toronto Rehab UHN. So when you get a spinal cord injury, there's essentially a disconnect between the brain and the muscles. You're not, you're not getting any motor signals. So I just wanted to know, how do you design your neuroprosthetic devices to overcome this limitation in signaling? That's correct. There's a disconnect. But the challenge is that actually our brain is not just what we have in our head, but it actually goes down the spine almost to the lumbrical level, which means that a lot of control signals and control circuits, sort of speaking, from the engineering point of view, which are regulating reaching, breathing, blood pressure regulation, and walking, are actually down in a spinal cord. So when the injury happens, there are things which happen. One thing is there is an interruption of the command, which comes from the upper parts of the brain, which is a supraspinal command. And the second problem is that the control uh, circuits, sort of speaking, which are in the spinal cord, get damaged and disrupted. And that can result in issues like not being able to walk. So how do you help these patients? How do you design your neuroprosthetic devices? So the the purpose of the neuroprosthetic devices is actually to artificially activate the the neuromuscular system. And by doing that, you generate the contractions in the muscles in a way that they can do different tasks, like opening hand, closing hand, walking, breathing. Okay, great. And so, yeah, you're using electrical stimulation to get these. That's correct. And and the sequence in which they fire, it's all done in-house, or do you sometimes mine the literature? I know, for instance, they have these very human-like robots that can walk. Do you ever use that information, or it's all in-house? No, I mean, you you do everything. You go through literature, then uh, you do your own experiments, and the hybrid of these two things is like a protocol that you come up with. And I can tell you with high confidence, when you apply it to the patient, it never works. So (laughs) then you have to go and fine-tune it and, and... and, and actually come up with the recipe, sort of speaking, or the protocol, which actually makes sense. Interesting. So you said you were able to do a, a bunch of different movements. Uh, in your experience, which is the most challenging you've tried so far? Which has been the most difficult? I think the, the, the many. I mean, they're, all of them are very challenging. The good news is with reaching and grasping, which is very important function for us, is most of that can be done in open loop control. Method. It means you, you, you know exactly the sequence that you need to do to open and close the hand. So you can just fire the whole sequence ahead of time, and as the sequence executes, the patient will execute the task. The challenge with um, things like standing or sitting control, and that projects into walking, is the balance regulation. So you need to see how your posture changes in every instant in time and correct for that in a closed-loop fashion. That hasn't been really resolve properly in the field. And at the moment, that, that's where we're focusing our efforts to try to find how to control this in a closed loop. But we're making progress in the right direction. And right now, we are able to control at least uh, two joints simultaneously in real time. And we can get people to stand for 10 minutes constantly. So we are making progress in a direction that this technology should be available in about four or five years, at least in a lab environment. And that hopefully it will uh, project itself in uh, some product. So I think the next challenge is to really get somebody to stand with electrical stimulation or to sit properly in a closed loop fashion. So if I push you, the system will correct for, for perturbations in real time. Once we capture that, then, you know, sky, sky is the limit. You guys made a really interesting discovery. Uh, whenever you give a talk, you show videos, and I don't want to give away the punch, but your work essentially produced a very unexpected but exciting phenomenon. So when patients use these neuroprosthetic devices uh, quite regularly, wh- wh- what happens? We discovered they start becoming better and better. And over time, actually, they didn't need it at the end. They were able to do a lot of things on their own. So we actually switched the focus of the, of the technology in the field. Instead of making a permanent device, we went and tried to find out to what extent can we actually use this technology to reprogram the brain, to retrain the brain, to execute a task that has been impaired by an injury. The good news in our case is that uh, we can apply this technology to people who can't move at all and really get them from zero to being able to reach, grasp, and walk. What do you think some of the uh, major challenges are in, in, in your field right now? The major issue is how to get all the signals out of the brain wirelessly. 
Oh, okay. So, and uh, the main issue is essentially the energy. Uh, you can have a Bluetooth communication, but this is taking a lot of energy. We have, as a lab, uh, proposed some technologies, and we have actually submitted a few patents as a solution to the problem. And now we're looking for partners how to commercialize that. So there is a light at the end of the tunnel, but tunnel is, you know, pretty long, like one, one of those good Swiss tunnels. I've been your host, Alex Albanese. Our theme music was provided by podcastthemes.com. The full version of this interview, as well as other episodes of Focal Point, are available at ibbme.utoronto.ca. Thanks for listening.